A uh, lovely welcome to my talk. It's uh, let's talk about privacy. Um, yep. Okay. So um, I um, do first the intro. Um, probably uh, who I am. I'm a kendo. I'm just like the regular guy from Berlin. And what I do is I do crypto parties a lot. Um, and recently I had certain problems, you know. We, I've been into the situation and when we are on crypto parties we have often people that are aware about their privacy, they are about their, their need to do something, right? And I had the situation with friends of mine people that are close to me that were in the situation unable to understand my argumentation. They were not really caring for privacy. And this is what this talk is going to be about. It's going to be about uh, privacy, but not in the sense of here I want to convince you why privacy matters, but rather as an idea to get an argumentation base so people get a better understanding why we're caring for privacy. Um, this kind of started with a friend of mine who went to a little bit far away and I was like, hey, we should probably encrypt our communications because people could might read this. And he kind of really blew that and that said, yeah, I, don't, I have nothing to hide. And I was really frustrated. I was not able to tell him, hey, this is important, this matters, people kind of did not get this and I also was a little bit troubled and was not, not able to give him the message. Uh, by the way, sorry, I just remember something. I have to apologize to you first up because um, I did wrote and when I subscribed this actually talk, I did the description of the talk in German but actually holding no in English and it made a little bit people confusing and uh, I'm sorry for that. But because of this, um, this talk changed a little bit because what I originally intended to do and in which way I wanted to do changed to what it actually now developed to. It adapt and uh, I'm sorry. And further, I do this for the very first time here. I'm not the very first time in front of a crowd. And uh, if you have misunderstandings, if you have something you did not understood because of my language or something, please raise your hand, ask questions. If you something to add in addition to help me to give a better argumentation base, please wait a little bit. We have time. I added like at 20 minutes for the Q&A um, so we can get something together. If no questions are raised, we can continue a little bit different topics. Um, I had something prepared how you might could prepare on why you should maybe care for this. Um, yeah. So probably also the why again from a different angle, um, probably to understand why and to have a better foundation on obviously to grow on this because um, when I'm not able to communicate to people that are important to me how important this is to me and may not them understand, I probably did not understood it well enough. So and I start digging in and I look first in the definition of the word, where it comes from. Because one thing I realized with arguing with those people that were close to me is that they had a very different view of the word privacy as I do. And it basically goes like this, you know, when I need privacy, I shut down my computer, I go into the woods and I'm, I have my, my sphere, I have for myself, right? And um, the word should we start with is very interesting because it comes from the Latin language. It has been actually being around for, for quite some time in the ages of the Romans, they used to say it laws. And you might see the privata, which is like Italian, um, strada privata, private street. And it could be translated to, for example, the word self, something to myself, but also that it's separate it's a single thing, or maybe the best thing in this way that goes there, it's one's own. Obviously, this is the meaning of private, which then also could be amplified to private ownership or a company's private. When we would use this term in a sense of privacy, it would be translated something like this. Something is not public. 
I don't want to have certain records in the public. I care that these are not dealt with in the public. Um, can you hear me, Mr. Good? Okay. And um, basically, what they said is, and this is the fundamental element people know, which have been educated to them the most, which have been talked to them, that privacy is a right to be left alone. And everyone knows this, but in this one, they have seen just a particular one. It says that they have the power to decide on two if they want to be with people or not. And this one defines basically the realm of physical privacy, basically the ability to go away from people, to be not under people because maybe we need to gather ourselves, maybe it's crucial because we need to think about the things we want to do next and people then to do an influence on us, opposing their opinions and sometimes this kind of things are hurtful and therefore we need to go, we isolate ourselves together to gain strength. Also the term actually have been um, be first around, around um, 1980-90 by an American within the article, the right to privacy. <coughs> I want to point this out because this is a natural impression people have about privacy, that there, you know, you can shut down your computer, you go somewhere, you have your privacy. Privacy in a sense, people don't care about, like, when I'm home, I'm home, I have my realm, I have my sphere, no one can hurt me. But it's just a physical privacy we're talking here about. And there's more to this, because we care for discretion and intimacy. It means basically when I have certain concerns, I might gather around my friends, I share this concern about other people, about my family, to get them helping me maybe to understand each other. But sometimes those things are hurtful, they're kind of a problem, and I don't want maybe others I've talked about to know this. It helps me maybe to understand this, but you know, when I was younger, it was a little bit e uh, easier. I went to school, let my friends in school, and when I went home, I was at home. And when I brought a fr friend home, he obviously know that my frustration with my mother or uh, other people would not be showed to them. And we all know that when we go to the doctor, we care for this, the discretion. When we go there, that only he knows about my concerns, about my health care problem maybe. Or when I go to a lawyer, that he really keeps the secret I share with him, which might be dangerous for us because they are, um, could be criminal. Therefore, we care for discretion and intimacy. And we all know those feelings when someone is talking to you, you know, you want that the person I shared with keep it. And imagine, you know, you look at this little orange guy and he, he, he whispers in your ear, I know all of your secrets and I'm going to tell it everybody. <laughs> I think we know how this feels. It's very hurtful. It, is an act of betrayal, one of like the most and uh, hated emotions. You can see it when people that were a couple, they were together, sometimes after a breakup, how hurtful they become because they are, share this information. We share them in a very close space and they use them against you because when we share these thoughts, this emotion with others, we become vulnerable to them. And this is one element. You want not that information you may have disclosed to a certain person being disclosed to others into the public. But beside of that, the information we shared off, it's also very important and for us that we have the freedom to self-determine information disclosure, the ability to define who I tell what and who I tell not to. Because one thing of this, I'm um, with my friends, I might tell something that I would not tell my mother. In the sense of, we know we shared uh, some drugs together and we had an enjoyable time. 
I might not tell this to my mother because she gets concerned of addiction, of negative consequences, or other things that I might share my thoughts as an um, engineer to my boss, which I might not want to share to the upper management in a company because it could com be compromising. And also the fact that information need to be shared can lead to a certain problem. Because sometimes I know something I need to disclose, but it could co be compromising. At this point in time, I care for enormity. Maybe the information could be so compromising that just raising it, saying it, would compromising myself as a person. I, as this person, would be probably thrown in jail, I would be prosecuted, people would act violence. So we like to, to do this in enormity as a crucial element of our society to express ourselves. Sorry. So also, also we're using this in our democratic system as a tool for voting, as a crucial element to express ourselves in this democracy system. Which, by the way, there were quite funny thing on the side. You know, there someone told me, I think over those days now, that some of the voting machines supposed to be designed for voting being so good that they could not recognize who have voted. And then they said, like, yeah, we did not know who voted then and who not. And that's kind of interesting. So, there's a little bit of division now, you have got a view, you see the private privacy of a person is not just limited by his physical, but also to his relationships he care, the information he disclose, and maybe that information maybe not be related to me as person, or certain types of information should not be related to other persons I've chat with. But there's more to this, or Sorry, um, there are now those points where this being violated, where invasion happened of my privacy. But we should also understand this, that we are the ones making the deci decision uh, about our privacy. And privacy in this point is like a, cu uh, a cupcake. Yay, cupcakes. So um, there's this beautiful example of this, because when we are in the situation to make a decision about our privacy, we often do the same decisions as we do it with food. When you're at home with your mama and she makes and bakes beautiful cupcakes, are your first thought is, ah, maybe I should not eat this because it would have bad consequences for myself in the future. Or are you eating this because you're being rewarded, A, by your mother smiling because she made something for you, and B, the chemical reaction, this beautiful uh, cream bombs does. And the same applies, for example, for a lot of things. When you look into the healthcare, they had a lot of policies that forces companies to reveal what of ingredients they put into certain things, what they have been the cake been baked with, what of materials, and people seem not really much to care. So they just go to the next fast food line and say, yeah, I want a burger, I want to eat, I want to be filled, and not thinking about the consequences it might include for their future. And this is related to a fact that they do a temporary discount. They don't see the consequence in this moment. They are unable to see this because, you know, if I eat one cupcake, two cupcakes, five cupcakes, I don't see it immediately. I see it probably in the next morning on the wait. I see it maybe in the next weeks when my uh, belt is not anymore fitting. Uh, so, but there's obviously other things to this because this is the one side. This is the person who shares information. The one does the decision to this. But when we share something, for example, on Facebook, it's made very rewarding because every time we share something and we get one of those beautiful like buttons and we see within the window how something plopped up and things happen, our brain rewards us. It gives us an uncertain impression of importance and we really like when we get feedback, we like when we share something and we kind of get even addicted to this. We want people to like our states. but. Facebook is implied with certain problems. Um, please 
don't think that I think Facebook is bad. Facebook is a company, and they care for one thing, for profit, obviously. And they're also interested in what they do. So there's some been very interesting studies lately. You might have heard it, you might have not heard it. But uh, there was a kind of manipulation that happens. So when you open up Facebook, the very first thing you see is the newsfeed, which is like updates of your friends and the environment, what people does, what they have shared, shared with. And what this Facebook network did, it deliberately favored content of typical type to trigger emotional reactions. This means basically that information I disclosed be keep back or might not even displayed at all and other information we might not even would have favored before showing up and the idea was basically to figure if people are acting positive on good news on you know uh, important things that seem to be caring for them and negative emotions by things that are bad like uh, a terroristic attack or something very dangerous happened to them and they could see in their research that this means that their people did react according to the amount of negative or positive information that came in. The comments were with I would say bad or good common statements and you could see that the emotional were triggered. And what was the most crucial thing you might would say, oh, I as person will not be affected of this, right? This study has been conducted with around 700,000 people. This is a real big number. And when you imagine how much this is, it could potentially affect everyone that uses Facebook in this entire room. And um, this is dangerous. But wait, there's more. Because even when you would say, okay, my knees feel, that seems so unlikely. There have been reports from our most famous agency, everyone probably knows in this realm, um, that used a tool to manipulate uh, organizations. Most of the people I then tell, like Occupy Wall Street, they're like, what? No, I, I don't know them, which is kind of a sad thing. But interesting to this, when I say, you know, flash mob, they're like, oh yeah, I know this guys. You know, my, my first experience with flash mobs were in the town I lived. Um, an event where they basically went to the biggest McDonald's in the region and said, yeah, you know what? We meet all those people in front of it and then we try to eat the entire stock down. And really, I think around 3,000 people showed up. They went to the McDonald's and they tried to eat this thing empty. Unfortunately, they did not manage to because on time the manager of this small McDonald's ordered new resupply and kind of did well. But um, what they did is they test their tool um, on these people, on these flash mobs, by manipulating messages. For example, instead of the date of tomorrow at 12, it was Monday uh, in two weeks at 12, or even keep the message back of not being delivered. And this means that the uh, information I disclosed was compromised. And this is happening in Facebook. But yet, even when you decide, I, I'm not part of Facebook, I don't like Facebook, it's kind of a bad thing, they're still tracking you. And this is the thing what people kind of makes weird. At this point, people get becomes emotional. They're like, suddenly get this realization. And it's very important to keep them, hey, this is an argumentation. These are facts. These are things that are happening. Um, basically, what Facebook does, uh, they create a cookie every time, like a small piece of information your browser keeps. And when you visit, for example, a fan page or a certain resource on Facebook, your web browser keeps being tracked with that. And the other problem in this is you have a blog you're visiting, you like to read, and he embeds a Facebook like Twitter, Google Plus. And what he does, ah, oh, sorry, uh, what he does is uh, what he does is basically he loads every time you visit the website the Facebook like from it and now you tell us when you visit your blog which might be self-hosted at least that you have been visited to this website with the uh, thing but I think 
Facebook is not the only problem, right? Because um, Google is the same, and it's quite interesting to see because um, when you see this way, you could define it as a gateway drug. You will probably ask why, but who in this room here um, owns an Android device? So quite a lot of hands went up, right? Um, so who of you in this room uses YouTube? I mean, this entry talk is going to be uploaded to YouTube, so again, Google knows what. Funny fact, by the way, Google is the biggest search engine in the world. YouTube is the second biggest uh, search engine in the world. And obviously, a lot of people are using Gmail. Google search, we just did today at Google search. Some people. <laughs> um, so this is very interesting because you're not able to avoid this. You kind of, even when you say, I don't use Gmail, I don't use Google search, I use a, a super great DuckDuckGo, I use Start Page, I use peer-to-peer -peer search engines to get my information. Um, you still have the problem, for example, in Android, to use Android properly with get the cool, awesome tools, you need to be locked in to the Google Play Store, which then registers your phone with all the information to Google, and then you can use it, then you can load, download applications, right? Also, the very first thing Google does, it uploads everything on your phone when it's being logged in. It loads up your calendar, it uploads your contacts, it uploads your Wi-Fi passwords as backup. Of course, you can disable this, but who does this? Who thinks about this? Um, and there's even this, let's say it, um, no direct Google service problem. Because even when you have said, I have no Android phone, I don't use YouTube, I always go to media.ccc.de to get my, my content, um, there's this uh, called, let's face it, um, Google Fast Web Project. Because, you know, the Google guys, they are caring for fast internet connection. They want to have everything as fast as possible on there. And one problem they often share is that they have libraries from the projects, for example, from uh, jQuery, which load very slowly because the original server is kind of loaded and it takes time to read its response. So they made this Google Fast Web Project. Or you could phrase it that way. It's Google hosted libraries for web applications. So when you have this, basically what happens is fonts, Ajax, jQuery, everything you might need to illustrate a website being loaded from Google service directly. So you have really hard trouble to avoid Google in this particular point. You have no possibility of just say, I don't care about it and I just put it away. And this is kind of invasive because Every time you load a website, a blog, or what page you want to, they go to Google and send an information to this. Most people I've seen over the past years have changed their DNS entries to the name server of Google, which makes it even more easier to get an understanding of this. And just by saying, you know what, you disclose information to Google about your behavior, and then they get an understanding. Oh, yeah. Um, but you know what? I shut down my computer. I I quit this. I just I don't care, you know. And then I go into my living room. I play a round of Xbox One. And suddenly I get a fall in the game. There's been a report over the last days or actually a year, I think. I'm not certain anymore about the source. Too much information. Um, where by cursing his opponent, enemy team in the game, he was punished. So you play at home and this Xbox One is listening to what you're saying. They have even a camera which kind of actually observe you. And you say, what the fuck? And you lose points, you lose. So the game, the player was punished for cursing at home for gaming, something he did in private. And you might think, what the, hä? Why, why are they doing this? So, okay, okay, okay. I, I, think, I think I've got the point. So, you know, you close down your exports one, you open up your TV, and then 
suddenly you realize something maybe. I hope you can read this. But basically, the Samsung TV you might have, where you actually want to play Xbox One on, is listened to you as well. You can disable this. But for example, there's an uh, agreement that says, please don't say anything private in front of the TV. It might be recorded. And you know, what's really, really thing, I hear recently a message from someone said like, it, I don't know how official this is, but basically what happens is when your Xbox is listening to you or your personal assistant like Siri, that they take the, text, uh, the message you said, convert it to text and upload it to the server. Obviously, because you have bandwidth, because your voice is uh, kind of much. But there are actually people that are there listening and reading the text you uploaded there, that has been uploaded there. So I don't know how much truth this is, how much is related to this, but basically, people that were really private and did disclose sexual information or medicine related information were listened by this, and the services had all this information in there. Okay, you know, um, I did also a lot of research and I struggled across this website. You might see this, right? Uh, our favorite um, agency, German type. And why I was reading this article, something in my eyesight came there. You know, maybe you see it. You see this thing here, right? I was like, what's that? Like, CS? Okay, I open up and this is a belt. This belt sends you mail when you do fat. You put it across your, bell, uh, uh, your belly and when it's not fitting anymore, it says a message to you, obviously over the crowd. And I mean, it basically tells me, and one thing I did not concern about this, who decide when I'm too fat? I was not really sure about this. I did not research this further, no. But nothing tells more about your how weighted you are and obviously um, this is kind of very very invasive which brings us maybe to the thing oops um, internet of the things um, I think each and every one of you have here a little bit of this the definition is quite simple to this it's trying to bring chips into every uh, uh, everyday household devices that your lamp is able to send you a message that it might be going to break down so that you can refresh it on time, so you're not in the dark. Your refrigerator sending, hey, the milk is expiring. Please make sure to refresh the new ones, and so on. And these are very invasive. These are the things that is going to happen. This are, is actually happening at this point. And everything is being uploaded to the cloud. So I, I'm not sure if you yet then can share uh, your fridge status at Facebook. There's a possibility of connecting your, your fridge to Facebook. At least this is what I uh, read a while ago. I'm not so sure, and I didn't test it. And one thing is why. You might ask why, and thinking why they're so invasive, why they do this, why there's this point that they try to. I mean, very interesting. Facebook is actually one big contributor to open source. A lot of technologies they put in there is open source. So they cannot be other evil, right? But as Bruce Snyder put it in a beautiful sentence, surveillance is a business model of the internet. So and one thing that made a lot of confusion, a little of bit misunderstanding to each of everyone was this keyword. Because you hear, you know, every one of these people have heard about Edward Snowden, they have heard of the NSA and how they're being surveilled, and they heard about the word metadata. So metadata, what is what is metadata? And just today I heard a beautiful example. Basically, when you try to get in Germany a credit, you go to Schufa, which is like a credit. Uh, rating agen uh, agentur. And what they do is they look at certain data, which could be described as metadata, and how likely, based on this data, you are to be a reliable, uh, reliable payer. 
You also could describe it in a technical term. This is a data about data. So to make a uh, phone call, I need A, my number, B, the number I try to call, and C, the date when the phone started and ended. So the telecom company can bill, they're able to route the phone through the network to your friend. There were a beautiful example by the EFF about this. It's, you know, you're standing on the bridge, you're calling a suicide hotline. What you're telling them on the top of the bridge keeps, uh, remains secret, but it's kind of obviously what you do. Because when you, for example, use a phone, a mobile phone in this case, it's also storing the location. This is, by the way, uh, a very the very description of the Vorratsdatenspeicherung, each, every one of this, or data pre preservation or retention to English. And basically, they store this type of information, where, who, what. I think most of the people know this in a certain way, but what's very interesting when you put this and apply this to your own life, because they're thinking, yeah, now this type of information not being that crucial, I think, you know, I can put this into the public. They've been, by the way, by the CSU, uh, I think, a beautiful example where they said, yeah, you know, this type of information are like digital fingerprints, the poli uh, poli police <laughs> uh, needs to, dis uh, to, to identify p potential criminals, right? And it was a little bit, uh, yeah, no. So I made this uh, for myself. I hope you can read this. It's a little bit full, but it was like my VPN logs. I, I'm a guy, obviously, I run everything, and you know, VPN is encrypted. It's, there's no information being disclosed, unencrypted, so if someone could read this. But what it really told was a little bit, uh, for example, when I started. You know, my laptop always connects automatically to the internet, to my VPN server when I open up the lid. And I just looked at this, you know, this is like one day. And it started like, you know, 8.56. And um, probably at this time I started my laptop, right? Your first connection, you read emails, you check what is going on. Maybe there's a certain delay with the public transportation. Um, I keep my device probably running, I don't know. And at a certain point, you see the connection from my server to the end device is lost. Um, Maybe he went somewhere. I mean, it's Monday in the week. What some guy who works in IT does at 9.32, probably. Oh, wait, 10, uh, 10 17. Something is again. Ah, oh, new IP address. So he maybe went to work. You can see VPN connection timed out again between 12 and 13. And I'm such a guy. I, I always take my laptop with me, actually, or very often. and. What could a guy do within the week on Monday between 12 and 30 o'clock? He probably goes to lunch. <laughs> and then you can also see, uh, yeah, VPN connection reestablished from the original IP address from where I was at work. And you see, oh, he's back from lunch. So a while later, it's like 6 o'clock, the VPN connection times out again. And you see, oh, I think he's off work, right? And a little bit while later, from the connection, from the very same IP address I had in the morning, a new connection. I arrived home. Yay. And at last, 11.15, the connection went there. Maybe I went to bed. This is probably not as exact, but you get probably an idea of how my day would have looked on this day when I worked, when I did this. I actually did it to a little bit bigger extent before I cut it down because you could actually see anomalies within this when I went probably to certain places and when you know which IP address belonged to, you got a really good idea. And this is just like one service. It does not include web logs for, or like proxy logs. It does not include my mail log. It does not include my Java log. And this is kind of frightening. But, you know, you told your friends and then you comes with this beautiful question. Why should we care? Um, one example for this is actually, I heard it, I think, yesterday or in the last two, three days, that people in France that do pirating with peer-to-peer -peer should be put onto the anti-flight list. So, and imagine how they're going to gather the information that you use peer-to-peer. -peer. Metadata. 
that check what connection you did and what type obviously the connection was. And probably, and this is obviously the most critical one in this, this is a former CRI director and he did publicly stated in an interview that they kill people based on this metadata. This is the same information I just showed to you are used to kill people. And this is frightening. Um, you should also see this point. He, he made it, he, he reduced his statement at a certain point because he said the metadata the NSA has are different from the ones we just mentioned here because obviously they have way more metadata than I could just show to you. But I think there's a lesson to learn because who have of you heard of the CIA torturing project? So there's been a quite big scandal uh, because within the States uh, there was a report uh, made by the Senate that basically stated that the CIA have tortured people in the name or against terrorism and a lot and many have died. And these people have been catched based on such information. And this is probably the hardest thing. No one of them really revealed information that had something to do with terrorism. This were a person like you and me that lived in an area which was very, very badly, that had no potential of good work, so they looked for jobs and suddenly they, walked, uh, they, they talked to the wrong people, they had made a f wrong phone call and snap, it was catched. Uh, obviously this is quite a, a critical thing, but it gives a certain insight how far our own physical privacy can be invaded by information we disclose. And even more the fact that information I might have disclosed in one realm might be manipulated, might be changed, might be deliberately stopped so it cannot reach. There's even in Germany, for example, the sample that, you know, this uh, one report which was done by I don't want to say it, but RTL, and basically um, it put a view on how a gamer should look like, and it was actually quite wrong, at least how people told me. So there were a lot of people, there were a big group on Facebook, and they said, you know what, we go to demonstrate on, uh, on this. Um, so when the people arrived, or at least the one who tried to organize this, he was the only one. There were randomly two people, but they were not related to, and the, his friends on the other side say, later said that they did had different appointments and even the message was not delivered. So like everyday people get affected of this very particular thing. And this does not include the problem with email, it does not include the problem with the overall thing. Um, I actually have a little bit more slides to this, but I will try to stop now um, to allow questions for this regards when questions are there. I also open for any additional supply to this and um, hope you liked it for the moment. So any questions, any complaints, criticism, misunderstandings, additions? I think you could add that um, the metadata are very, um, very interesting to insurance companies because you cited as an example um, of a threat that maybe the CIA is uh, out to get you and I think most uh, of us in this room don't feel personally threatened by that. But uh, having insurance companies um, collect your metadata is, um, is I think a more real threat and um, as you said it can uh, affect your Shufa. Mm. Uh, entry and um, might of course affect your insurance rates if they can conclu make conclusions about uh, risky behavior on your part. Thank you very much. Any further questions? So um, I'm kind of surprised, I, I kind of expected that people would now raise and say, no, that's wrong, or this is kind of, 
need, uh, need to be there or something. Okay. Um, one thing I wanted to uh, I'd put in addition to this is, let's say, how we can prevent something like this, how you should behave. What I would expect probably from my friends, what I wish from people that are close to me to do this. Maybe to keep data to yourself um, in a sense of, you know, you don't, when you need to use some service, you need to use Facebook, don't share everything on this. Go there, subscribe what you need to subscribe, like what you need to like, and then it's it. Don't disclose too much information. You already share too much. There's a very beautiful principle for this, which uh, interesting uh, to German, it's um, Datensparsamkeit. If you try to translate this, it's a little bit difficult to do this. Uh, basically, principle of data economy or data redu uh, reduction in data economy. You know, we have a society or um, 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 technology which is interested in grabbing every piece of information, every bit of information about you to squeeze the last drop of your privacy out to make money out of this. And sometimes you can, for example, not avoid using Facebook. But for example, what's quite funny, you can, f uh, can, you can use, for example, Facebook with Tor, if you can relate to this. They have an own onion address to this. W with this address, you can simply open it up, you log in, it works, no problem. <coughs> Sorry. So here's a little bit an overview of what I've done about this, because I'm administrator, I'm aware of this, I try to reduce my data print in the internet, which brings me, by the way, to a certain thing, because I had certain concerns, because this is a recorded talk, and you know, I do a talk about privacy. Do I record this? Do I put it in the internet? Do I allow people to live stream this in particular? And but. I had very interesting feedback, and especially this, this is a public talk in any way. I talk to a crowd of people. I try to teach what I learned. I want to show my horizon I extended and hope that people can align to this. And I think it's also very helpful to others, and it may be available resources to others in a later point. So I decided, and because I have the ability to decide to, to let it be uploaded, to be streamed. Um, what I do is I run Linux, obviously, like most of the people here. Um, I changed my uh, Android. I have a smartphone like most of you. Um, but very interesting was I uh, use Saigon mod. Most of the people that try to avoid Google does use this. But I then realized something very interesting. I'm safe right now. And then I remember, oh, wait, 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 there's this Google Play problem, and I have no internet. <laughs> Shit. Normally, that would be the logo of Google Play. But basically, as I described it before, every time you try to use your smartphone with good applications, you need to log into the Google Play, which needs an email address. Very interesting to this is as well, even when you're not using Google Play, you have no account to this, Google has the power to remove applications from your device entirely they can remotely delete this. There are only very few examples of this. You barely find any resources to this, but there are examples to this, and the entire Google library is a problem in this. What you can do is, when you install Cyogen mod, you, cannot, you can choose to not install Cyogen mod with the Google Play library. Um, this is quite helpful because um, you're not sharing any information with that. But at this point, it becomes difficult to run applications you want. What I did in this particular, I used the F-Droid. F-Droid is an uh, open source based repository for Android applications. And um, I synchronize most of my information I have with my own cloud. So again, on this. Um, yeah, I'm quite finishing right now, because <laughs> now to my uh, last words. <laughs> To, <clears throat> to protect your privacy is hard. It's very, very, very hard to do this. Because even when you try to actively not involve this, somewhere have stored your contact data in their address book, which was uploaded to Facebook, uploaded to Google, or any other third service I did not mention yet. And even 
when you're not using this technology, it's somewhere on a computer, all of your information has been stored in any way. And the only thing what we really can do is we can increase the cost someone has to take to gain information about us. This is the only thing we are able to. And I really, really, really hope this gave you an, a little bit inside of a better argumentation foundation to get people motivated maybe to care more about their privacy. Um, and all what I can now say is uh, thank you for listening. Any questions? Thank you for your talk first. Maybe more of a statement than a question to your last statement that um, you're talking about increasing the costs for the people that uh, have negative effects by uh, doing surveillance on us. But the thing is, they get the money from us in the first place. So I would also put the focus in the thing that we have institutions, states and companies that violate our human rights, but that have the power from us that th at least theoretically can be taken away from them. Questions? Okay, I guess this uh, is it. Uh, please note, uh, I put this talk under the Creative Commons. Um, you can get it at any time. Uh, also, I have to thank to certain people, uh, at least if there were two I hope to see in the room, but I don't see this, which was Slido and uh, uh, or helping, reviewing, going through this, my girlfriend, my pe people around me, everyone who have listened over the last days to me. And here are the references which kind of include everything, but it's a little bit cut because um, the slides does not support this. And yeah, you can get the full list at, uh, if you want to. I can give you the presentation and I will put it obviously online soon. Thank you very much.